Hey, Granger and Erin. Uh, both of you guys were gone today for um, different reasons, but um, I thought I would go ahead and do an abbreviated video of my lecture today. Um, since, Erin, um, you'll be behind and it, this will help you get caught up. And Granger, I know you're probably only going to be gone for the day, but um, since we have a test on Friday, I wanted to make sure that you um, were able to uh, hear the information. So uh, for both of you, I gave this class uh, chapter seven and chapter eight terms from the Eric Foner Give Me Liberty book, which coincides a little bit with chapter six of the AMSCO book that we uh, read for the last few lessons. Uh, and so just as a reminder, um, we are in period 3B, which basically is the latter half of period three. I split it into two periods because it's so long. It starts with the French and Indian War, goes all the way through the John Adams presidency. So um, 3B is the Articles of Confederation, Shays' Rebellion, um, the Constitutional Convention, and then ultimately the election of George Washington, and then the second president, John Adams. So um, last class period, um, I introduced the presidency of John Adams. Uh, and so um, um, today I continued on the conversation about George Washington's presidency. And then um, I just got started with John Adams' presidency when the bell rang. So um, I am going to send some video links for the test on Friday. Aaron, I don't think you'll be obviously up for it, but Granger, I'm assuming you will be on track for that. So um, hopefully this will help you, but I'll send video links for the Heimler videos, uh, as well as a study guide that will kind of direct your studying uh, for the test. But basically chapter six in your AMSCO book, um, all of the handouts that I've given in class, the terms that I passed out today, um, and then... Um, yeah, I think that's it. So um, anyway, I'm going to uh, just give you a quick overview of what I did, I talked about in class today. So first of all, um, the article that I sent home on Monday called Washington and Slavery was a chapter taken out of um, a book called The Indispensable, Indispensable Washington. Um, not sure if I actually have it here with me, but uh, I copied the chapter out of it, got permission to. Um, and then, um, so it's a really interesting take um, on George Washington's view on slavery over the course of his lifetime. And uh, then we took a reading quiz over it. But before we took the reading quiz, I did do a little bit of give and take and talking with the students or with the class uh, just to make sure that they uh, were focused on the right material. So basically, I'm going to, again, just kind of review this with you. George Washington's view on slavery changed pretty significantly over the course of his lifetime. Uh, he was born into a period in time where um, the slave culture was just part of life. Uh, it, it wouldn't have seemed odd or strange to him growing up that people owned slaves, to see slaves working in the fields, um, and then to inherit those slaves when your parents passed on. Uh, and so that's what happened to George Washington when his, his parents passed on. Uh, he inherited about 100 slaves. And um, Mount Vernon actually was property of his wife's family. So when he married Martha Custis, um, he um, took on uh, Mount Vernon, the estate of Mount Vernon, which was her, it was her family estate. I think it may be the family she had married into. She was a widow. So anyway, he had inherited 100 slaves or so from his family. And when she, um, when her family passed away, she, maybe even her husband, uh, she inherited about 200 slaves. And so I don't know how many slaves were living at Mount Vernon at any given time, but they were getting married and having children. So I would imagine that slave force got larger over the course of time. Um, so again, he grew up in a period of time where that was not unusual. Um, in some of his early writings and correspondence, he talks about slaves as anybody would have then, as if they were property to be bought and sold. Uh, but sometime in his, I will say, later adult life, later young adult life, so maybe in his, maybe in his thirties, um, he began to feel a little uncomfortable about slavery and feel a moral conflict over the fact that America was. Um, pursuing liberty for all men, but there was a group of men and women in the society that were not experiencing liberty. In fact, they were enslaved. And so um, I believe that the, the, the reading assignment said that um, sometime before the American Revolution, he came to the conclusion that um, to be a slave was a terrible, terrible thing, a terrible station in life. 
and that the slaves that he interacted with had nothing. They had lost everything. Um, the only thing they really had was the the people that, that were like them, that surrounded them, and that were sort of like their extended family, the other slaves. And so he determined he would no longer sell slaves and separate family uh, units. He just didn't feel like he could do that anymore. So he didn't buy or sell slaves uh, unless with their consent. So for instance, if um, I'm just kind of making this up, but if one of his slaves um, wanted to marry this, a slave girl from another family, perhaps they would make an arrangement. But generally speaking, um, from the time of, oh, let's say uh, 1770, and for the rest of his life, he did not buy and sell slaves. And in fact, he encouraged slaves to marry. That was not the custom of the era. In fact, um, marriage was discouraged as the, it confused the um, property pool, who belonged to who. Generally speaking, slaves, children, the wom woman and her children, uh, is it was the family line uh, because people wanted to hold on to the property or the person, the slaves that were born because they were very valuable. And so... During the American Revolution, George Washington um, ultimately eventually encouraged desegregation of the army, though at first, coming from the South, he was a little uncomfortable, was a little startled to see uh, free black regiments uh, in New England. But I think the more time he spent in the North, uh, the more time he felt um, that slavery was immoral and that it was an institution that needed to um, come to an end. He was very careful about who he vocalized that to. It was not a popular viewpoint. Um, it was very unpopular amongst his Southern peers, his Southern friends, those from Virginia. And um, ultimately, um, he there is much correspondence between him and other abolitionists and folks that were not um, favorable to or were not in favor of slavery. Uh, but he was very careful about how he communicated that and who he communicated that to. Um, Let's see here. I uh, had a text message come in. Um, let's see, what else? Um, so he encouraged slave marriages, even though that made his particular situation confusing because many of his slaves married many of his wife's slaves and the property rights got kind of intermingled. And when it came time to uh, consider freeing them, it was difficult to determine who could, who could be freed and who couldn't be freed, whose children could be freed and who couldn't. And so it kind of complicated matters. Um, when he went to Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia, to serve as president, uh, he got another, um, I would say, uh, view of reality. Uh, he tended to favor uh, Alexander Hamilton's view of America, that America was going to become an industrial powerhouse, a manufacturing sector, banking, international trade. And Washington understood that America could become affluent, um, it could become very rich without the moral stain of slavery. When he looked to the South, he could not figure out a way to make plantation farming profitable outside of slavery. There was not a workforce, a free workforce large enough uh, to make plantation farming profitable. And he could not figure out um, how to um, help bring an end to slavery. Eventually, he did concoct a plan in which um, he determined that he would, this was, this was, the outward appearance of this plan was not the same as the reality of what he was doing. He wanted to, to give the perception that he was going to try something that would be, uh, would make him money, would be lucrative. Um, and so, but the, the end goal was to um, move his slave, his unfree labor force to a free labor force that was paid for their work. So he decided he would reach out to some of his contacts in England and see if there were English farmers who were uh, adept, very good at what they do, that would be would consider coming to the States and coming to Mount Vernon and renting um, the land, the property, the buildings, but not the slaves. Um, and that they would come, they would rent these facilities, and then they would pay the slaves as a free labor force to do the same work that they had done as slaves under George Washington. And he thought that this could begin to introduce the idea of freedom or free blacks working the land rather than being enslaved to the land. Um, unfortunately, he really was unable to um, seduce anybody to come to or a significant number of people to come and rent the property. And so the, the plans did not come to fruition, unfortunately. Um, Pennsylvania had an interesting law. Um, Philadelphia, the U.S. capital at the time, uh, before, the, before Washington, D.C. was built, where George Washington lived and served as president, um, 
he took a lot of his household servants to Philadelphia with him. Um, and when he left the presidency, he left many of his slaves behind because in Pennsylvania, uh, there was a law that said, if you bring slaves to our state, they will be automatically free once they've lived within the borders of our state for X number of months or X number of years. I'm not sure. I think it was a couple of years. Uh, and he knew that if he left them behind, that they would be emancipated. And so he quietly decided to leave them behind. Um, as he approached his death, um, he, he tried all kinds of different things. Uh, he tried to um, uh, put blacks in positions of overseers on his large spread of farms um, to give them skilled training about how to, to basically manage land and people and property and things. Um, unfortunately, when he returned after um, his time as president, all of the black overseers had been um, had left the job and had been replaced by white overseers that were doing a terrible job. Um, there was no, there was no incentive uh, to, uh, for correction if slaves were not doing the work they were supposed to do. Um, he, he didn't want to whip them. Um, they didn't have anything he could take away from them. Um, their pride oftentimes was not intact. They felt like they were of no value. And so um, when he did try to uh, teach them trades and even um, teach their children how to learn to read and write, there was a sense of, I'm a slave, I'm worthless, I don't even know how to be free. What does that mean? How do I be free? If I'm free, does that mean I have to leave, leave the estate of Mount Vernon? Where will I go? What will I do? What if I'm kidnapped to become another slave? And so um, the slave force at Mount Vernon was very fearful about freedom, um, generally speaking, uh, because it, it made their, their future uncertain. And I'm sure George Washington was a wonderful person to work for, um, even as a slave, uh, especially considering the alternatives. And so um, upon his death, George Washington willed um, his slaves that were part of his family inheritance, their freedom. Uh, and he wrote up the family documents in such a way that Martha's slaves would be freed upon her death. Um, uh, I think she lived about a year and a half, maybe two years after George Washington. At uh, the very end of the article, Abigail Adams, who is now first lady, comes to visit George Washington, or comes to visit Mount Vernon. George Washington has, has died. Uh, and let me turn that off real quick. Um, uh, and um, the estate is in just disarray. Um, the slaves, um, some of them are not working. Some of them are... Um, a lot of them are taking advantage of the crisis. Martha is just in complete distress uh, because she's worried about their wel welfare, what will happen to them when she leaves. And honestly, the Washington family went into a lot of debt uh, to care for, to take pay pensions for uh, their older and aging workforce and their younger workforce. They Washington just decided that I'm going to take care of these people. I'm responsible for them. I'm their uh, I'm their owner, and I do not want uh, to stand before God and be told that I did not care for those in my care. And so um, they 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 spent most of their money trying to care for a, st a, a large labor force that was largely not working by that point. So anyway. Um, Martha ended up allowing, giving her slaves their freedom before she passed away because um, she was, it actually was a little bit fearful that there was a target on her back in some way that um, they were all waiting around for her to die. Some of them were fearful about her dying because they didn't know what they would do once the Washingtons were gone. And so I think both of their children had passed away as well. So um, anyway, um, George Washington is a man of great character. Uh, and had a, a moral compass about him that is very unusual in anybody, let alone uh, people of that era. So anyway, that was kind of the review that I did with the kids before they took their reading quiz. It's a reading quiz that I created. Um, I read the article again myself, made note of some things that I thought were important, and just wrote questions about them. Most of them are multiple choice. There's a couple fill-in-the-blank questions. Um, so both of you will need to take the reading quiz at some point. I think, Granger, you said you'd be taking the reading quiz um, I think you said you were going to come in tomorrow sometime and take it. So sounds good to me. All right. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, on <clears throat> Monday, we talked about the George Washington's cabinet. Um, he, he had the, a fantastic cabinet of advisors. The constitution requires that, um, all cabinet members be um, confirmed by the United States Senate, so they were. I told the kids that the, on the test on Friday, one of the extra credit questions is to name 
the title and the people that were part of George Washington's cabinet. So make sure you uh, commit those to memory. It'll be, there'll be extra credit questions, but Thomas Jefferson was secretary of state. Alexander Hamilton was secretary of the treasury. Um, Henry Knox was secretary of war. John Adams was vice president. And while Edmund Randolph was the attorney general, you, I'm just, I'm not going to ask you about him. So, um, uh, if you were to take the IQ of the people in the room there, um, probably Alexander Hamilton would be at the top of the list. He was, um, although he was um, essentially orphaned, raised by a couple of men, um, I think maybe cousins or uncles or something um, in the Caribbean. He was a very, very, very brilliant man. And um, he probably had the smartest, the highest IQ in the room. And he was a good advisor to President Washington. Uh, President Washington tended to take a Hamilton side on most things. So just as a review, Thomas Jefferson was all things France, foresaw a future in America as an agrarian society. Thomas Jefferson started out in life opposed to slavery, um, promoted gospel literature for slaves and um, taking good care of slaves and to figure out a way to, to abolish slavery. But as he got older and recognized there's there was physically no way for that to happen and be profitable, during that era, um, apart from taking a personal hit for, hit for um, in your money and resources, um, he moved away from the idea of abolition. Um, so that anyway, that was um, George Washington's first cabinet. Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton did not get along. All right, the uh, only thing that I got to on Monday under this important domestic events of the Washingtons of Washington's presidency was the National Bank in the U.S. Constitution, or U.S. Capitol. And one of the things that I kind of circled the wagon on today uh, was uh, something related to the Constitution. So the Democratic Republicans, who were going to become the Democrats um, early in history under with Thomas Jefferson at the helm, he was the leader of the Democratic Republicans. Sometimes they were called Republicans. Sometimes they were called the Democrats. Uh, eventually, they're going to be called Democrats. But... Um, they were the opposition to the Federalists. So George Washington, John Adams, ha uh, Hamilton were considered Federalists, which meant they supported a strong federal or a strong central government. Thomas Jefferson and his friends preferred to support strong states' rights. Today's political parties are switched. Republicans tend to be limited government, states' rights, etc. Democrats tend to be centralized power, um, large government, um, that sort of thing. So um, when Hamilton discussed the idea of absorbing the debts of the states by the, the federal government, absorbing the debts in order to incur credit um, so that they could borrow money from foreign countries, um, uh, he did so under the guise that it was necessary and it was necessary and proper to have a bank of the United States in order to have a place to deposit tax revenues and to conduct the business of Congress and the business of the government. There is nothing in the Constitution that says Congress or the executive branch can have a bank of the United States. Uh, it's not listed anywhere. In fact, it's a huge power grab of centralized power to have a bank of the United States. Um, private banks would have been preferable. Uh, but, uh, this, you know, they're starting out new and fresh and really not knowing how this is all going to play out. And so Hamilton perceived that a, a bank, a centralized bank that would, could accept tax, um, tax revenue from um, the citizens of the country and then being able to write checks or borrow money from foreign countries would be essential for carrying, on the, carrying out the business um, of the central government or the federal government. Um, and uh, so this is called... Um, loose or broad constructionism. Alexander Hamilton looked at the Constitution and he said, hmm, there's nothing in there that gives me or Congress permission to pass a law uh, to create a bank of the United States. So if you read on down through Article 1, it lists 18 enumerated powers, the power to tax, uh, the power to, to declare war, the power to run a postal service. Uh, there's 18 specific listed things in the Constitution that Congress has the power and authority to do. And at the end of those 18 things, uh, there's a paragraph that says, um, Congress shall do um, everything necessary and proper to carry out the for, aforementioned enumerated powers or something along those lines, which basically that there are certain things you're going to have to do in order to fulfill the responsibilities that are listed in this Constitution. For example, um, one of the listed uh, powers of Congress, 
is to establish a postal service for the United States. Well, if you establish a postal service, you're going to have to have uh, routes and revenue to pay riders and roads in order to get mail from point A to point B. That's not listed in the enumerated powers, but it's necessary and proper to fulfill that responsibility. So Hamilton's thinking was, if Congress has the power to tax, it must be necessary and proper to have a place to put that tax revenue into a centralized bank. And so that's called the necessary and proper clause of the U.S. Constitution. It's also sometimes referred to as the elastic clause because it is stretched to mean way beyond what it means. In class, I use the example if I gave uh, Tyler a rubber band and I stretched that rubber band across the room, that is not the intended distance or purpose of that rubber band. It can do that. Uh, but that's not what it's for. It's, it's designed to hold things together, to wrap around a poster or something or in, in somebody's hair. It's not intended to be stretched clear across the room. Um, and so um, that's the reason it's called the elastic clause. Um, for instance, Democrats today believe that it is a, a, a human right, a, a right of every citizen in the United States to have health care. And if people can't have health care, can't afford health care, then it then should become the responsibility of the federal government to provide health care for people. Now, that is not listed in the U.S. Constitution anywhere. However, um, an argument can be made that it's necessary and proper for, pe for the people, for the government to provide that for them. And so stretch, stretch, stretch beyond the meaning of what, it, uh, beyond any limited government and uh, giving the government the power to um, to require tax revenue to pay for health care for every American. So uh, it's a stretch, basically. So Alexander Hamilton was a broad constructionist interpreting the Constitution broadly um, or loosely. Um, Thomas Jefferson was like, whoa, wait a minute. There is nothing in this Constitution uh, that provides um, any grounds for a bank of the United States. You cannot do this. Ultimately, back and forth and back and forth they went. Thomas Jefferson conceded that perhaps it might be convenient to have a bank uh, and to, to develop credit. However, he didn't like it, but he thought of a compromise. The compromise was, hey, the Southern states will support you in this effort if you are willing to consider that the new capital to the United States that is that is dictated in the U.S. Constitution uh, is carved out of space in the South. And so that was the deal they made. The Southern legislators would support Hamilton's plan in exchange for a city, a United States capital in the South. So Washington, D.C. is kind of tucked between Maryland and Virginia. So it's, it's effectively in the South. Um, okay, so that was the first thing. Um, the second thing was the rise of political parties and the two-party system. Uh, so, like it or not, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans represented two strongest um, lanes or opinions of Americans. Um, people tend to decide, go one way or the other, uh, whichever, you know, depending on whether they believe stronger in states' rights or a stronger centralized government. Um, and um, uh, while Washington definitely discourage the idea of a two-party system. Um, I think it's inevitable because we are a majority rule country. So when laws are passed or people are elected, it requires generally 51% of uh, the voting public. Uh, so for instance, in Georgia right now, there is a runoff election for the election that was held back in November for Senate. Um, i trying to think of his name. Um, Herschel Walker, former football player, is running for the United States Senate seat in Georgia, as is another guy who I can't think of his name. Um, and then there was a third party candidate that entered the race and took some of the votes away from the Democrat and the Republican. And because Georgia state law requires that uh, the candidates, uh, the winning candidate receive a majority of the popular vote, 51%, if they couldn't reach the 51% or 50%, I think it was, 50 plus, um, then they had to have a runoff election. So that's what happened. Both Herschel Walker and the other guy running against him, the Democrat, both got a little over 49% of the vote. The third party guy got a few little votes. 
uh, and it prevented the two major candidates from reaching that 50% threshold. And so in Georgia, you have to have a runoff election where then there's only two candidates. So one of those two candidates is going to get more uh, than 50%. Um, and if, I mean, think of it this way. If in every election, if, it if we were not a majority rule country and simply the person who got the most votes or the law that got the most votes won, then you could have a situation where you have 10 people running for president, say. Uh, one person gets 5%, one person gets 12%, one person gets 6%. It all adds up to 100%. Uh, but the most that any one person gets is, let's say, 14%. Uh, then they would become president because they got the most votes of everybody that ran. Um, that would be horrible because that would mean that 84% of the population did not vote for you. Um, and so majority rule is actually a good thing. However, it kind of does force um, the system into a two political party. Um, we've had different political parties over the era. The first ones, of course, were the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Um, eventually, they dropped the Republican part of it and it was the Federalists actually the Federalists ended up disappearing and morphing into what was known as the Whigs. So then you had the Whigs and you have the Democrats. And then eventually the Whigs kind of faded away and you had the uh, Free Soil Party, the Union Party, um, the popular populist party. But uh, really the main party that uh, evolved out of the Whig Party was the Republican Party. So you had the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Then we went through a phase of the Whigs and the Democrats. And then we went uh, moved into more of a Republican versus Democrat, and that's kind of where we are today. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. The next thing underneath uh, important do domestic events of Washington's presidency is the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, the legislative branch makes laws. The executive branch enforces the laws that are passed by Congress. And so that was the importance of George Washington. He was an enforcer. If Congress passed a law, it was his responsibility or the executive branch's responsibility to enforce the law. Uh, and during his first term in pre as president, Alexander Hamilton suggested that Congress pass a law enacting a direct tax on whiskey. Um, and... Um, Essentially, a lot of people drank whiskey and it would raise a lot of money for the federal government. But the whiskey farmers in Pennsylvania who grew the grain to make the whiskey were furious. They're like, why are you picking on us? Uh, this is like a Boston Tea Party type of thing. Uh, and they grumbled and they complained and they couldn't say no taxation without representation because it was their elected leaders that had voted for this direct tax or uh, majority of the leaders in the country. And so they determined they weren't going to pay it. And George Washington had a pretty critical decision to make. Uh, he could, um, you know, say, eh, what's the big deal? If they don't pay it, they don't pay it and choose not to enforce the law. Well, that would be a terrible precedent because it wouldn't be any different than the Confederation Congress when they would pass a law. None of the 13 individual states really cared to enforce it. Uh, and so they became irrelevant. And so George Washington knew if he did not enforce this law, he would become irrelevant. The office of the presidency would become irrelevant. So he went all in big. Um, he hired a militia or a small army of about 12,000 people. He mounted his white horse, I think named Nelson at the time, and he sent messages to Pennsylvania and said, you are in violation of the law. We are coming to arrest you. Uh, and they marched off towards Pennsylvania. And I'm telling you, um, it did not take very long. And the Pennsylvania farmers were like, you know what? Let's just pay the stupid tax. We'll pass the increase on to the consumer. And so they all disappeared into the woodwork, back into their homes and into the fields and into the forest. And by the time George Washington and his men re arrived in Pennsylvania, the rebellion had faded into nothing and the enforcement arm of the executive branch was successful. Um, so that is a very, very, very important event in George Washington's presidency. Uh, the next thing listed under important domestic events of the Washington presidency were the Indian conflicts that took place in the Ohio River Valley. And while we don't like to, um, that part of American history is a little uncomfortable. Um, the confiscation of Indian land, pushing them further and further west, it's uncomfortable. But um, I think you have to put into perspective um, that the Indians, most of them, uh, especially the ones that were the um, call, the um, settlers were experiencing in the Ohio River Valley, which is like Indiana, Ohio, Michigan area, uh, 
Initially, we're pretty civil, um, welcomed the white settlers, but as more and more settlers came, they became very unnerved and decided to um, ambush the efforts of white colonists to, uh, to settle in the area. Um, I read a, a book about this, it was fascinating. Um, initially, the, the uh, Native American tribes in the Ohio River Valley started killing um, the game, deer, squirrel, rabbits and stuff in the forest so that the settlers didn't have food. Um, and then they began to resort to kidnapping and killing people that wandered off the settlement. Children were kidnapped and taken to live, uh, to be acclimated into the Indian tribes. Um, land surveyors were kidnapped or murdered. Um, and then finally, there were a couple of Indian alliances in the Ohio River Valley, and their names are escaping me right now. Um, if it comes to me, I'll, think, I'll say it. But they coalesced together and decided to um, like really, really uh, um, create war against the settlers. And so the settlers hunkered down into their, their homes, their forts, um, and pleaded with George Washington uh, to send troops to help them. And so ultimately Washington did send about, I think it was 1200 men or so under the um, leadership of a guy by the name of General or St. Clair, Mr. St. Clair. He was a general during the American Revolution. Uh, he was probably too old and infirm to go, but he did it. And he found himself ambushed um, in the woods, surrounded by various Indian tribes. And they were, he and his men, he survived, but his men were slaughtered. Um, I think the book that I read said they lost three-fourths of their men, which to this very day um, uh, stands as the largest deficit in, in war in American military history. Um, and the Indians were, were totally, horribly, wickedly savage. Um, they came back to the camp after the battle and they decided to scalp all of the, the, the survivors as well as those that were dead at the camp. Uh, they disemboweled and uh, um, cut people up. Um, the women that were in the camp were also sliced and diced and put in a pile. And um, the reason we know this is that there was a, um, a contingency contingent that went back to bury the bodies. And when they got to the camp, they were just utterly horrified by what they saw. Uh, Washington was given the report. St. Clair was even, I think, indicted on some charges, but found not guilty for dereliction of duty or something. Uh, and Washington replaced him with a guy by the name of General Anthony Wayne, famously known as Mad Anthony, and he was gonna get those those Indians. And so uh, he went after the Indians in the Ohio River Valley. He successfully defeated them at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, um, and um, which was a, a great victory for him. And then um, following the victory, uh, the slaughter of the Indian tribes, um, Matt Anthony required the Indians to sign the Treaty of Greenville. And this is actually very important because it sets another precedent. In the Treaty of Greenville, the Indians gave up their rights to the land in exchange for cash. Um, so they were defeated anyway, uh, but for some reason, um, the U.S. government felt they needed to have a treaty of sorts with the Indian nations uh, where they agreed not to attack settlers anymore and we would pay them money to keep them quiet, to keep them in check. That's still, some would say that that's still the policy of the United States. I believe that Indians on Indian reservations still receive some sort of stipend from the U.S. government. So this becomes a pattern. We attack, uh, we get attacked, we attack them, we conquer them, uh, we have them sign a treaty uh, saying they won't attack us anymore, and then we agree to pay a certain amount of money per month uh, to help them settle into their new land, their new place. Eventually, we move to the reservation system, but there was still um, generally an obligation of money. Um, let's see here. Oh, okay, moving to foreign policy. So in the meantime, while George Washington is president, uh, Great Britain and France engage in war again uh, in another battle. Uh, they're, they're fighting again. Uh, and we had signed a treaty with the French during the American Revolution, which they came alongside us to help us defeat the British. And it was supposed to be a mutual uh, relationship. And the French decided that they were gonna call their call that card and, and request assistance from the Americans to help defeat the British. Well, George Washington knew we were not in a, a situation or a position where we could um, be involved in a, a European war. And so he um, drafted a proclamation called the Pro proclamation, of, proclamation of Neutrality in 1793. So at the end of his first term. Uh, and in that proclamation, the United States said we are we are not picking sides. We are neutral in this battle. 
Uh, it was really targeted towards the French who were insistent that we uh, help them in the war, uh, the Republic of France versus uh, the British, and, and George Washington said no. Um, so in spite of that, a, a French diplomat named Edmund Genet uh, came to the United States and began to solicit uh, or basically hire mercenaries, American mercenaries, uh, that would go over and fight for the French. Uh, and he didn't have many problems getting people willing to volunteer. And, and of course, it was it paid money. Um, most Americans disdain, had a great disdain for the British because of the American Revolution. Uh, and so he was able to hire a lot of mercenaries. George Washington got wind of it. And he was furious because of the proclamation of neutrality, that this was completely against our laws uh, and what we had set forth. And so he called essentially called Edmund Genet, they sometimes refer to him as Citizen Genet, uh, to the president's mansion in Philadelphia, where he had an audience with George Washington, and to Washington told him to stop it. You can't do this. And uh, Citizen Genet, or Edmund Genet's response was, I will, you cannot command me. I will tell you what to do. Uh, we have a treaty with you, and, and Alexander Hamilton makes the case that um, the same people that sent Edmund Genet over to be an ambassador had already cut off the head of King Louis, who the treaty was with. And so the treaty was no longer binding anyway. Um, so anyway, there, we watched a scene in the John Adams movie where uh, the two of them exchange words uh, in a group and a, a room full of uh, President Washington's cabinet. If I can find that on, on YouTube, I'll send it to you. But um, basically, George Washington's demeanor, attitude, shutting this guy down uh, was the last straw for Thomas Jefferson. He was tired of being uh, wrong and or being told that he was wrong. He supported the French. Uh, Hamilton supported the British, and he ended up resigning his position as Secretary of State uh, as a result of this conflict. And so, um, so no war with the British and the French. Um, to settle the problems with England, because England was like, why are the French hiring mercenaries from America? Um, do, does America want to go to war with us again? Uh, George Washington sent John Jay over to England to negotiate, or to Great Britain, to negotiate a peace treaty to make sure that uh, we didn't accidentally find ourselves in a situation where Brit the British declare war against us. Um, and so John, John Jay went over there. At the time, he was the acting Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He went across the seas. He negotiated a treaty that was pretty much favorable to the British. Um, there were some things left over from the Treaty of Paris that needed to get kind of wrapped up. For instance, the British still had soldiers in their forts um, in the central part of America. In the forts that used to be theirs before we won the American Revolution, they hadn't evacuated those forts. Um, the Americans had said they would pay the debts or the cost of the, the stolen property from the, the Tories during the American Revolution. We hadn't done that. So um, basically the treaty came back. It was very, very favorable towards the British, but it still was a treaty that said Great Britain and America are not at war with one another and won't be at war with one another. And that's what George Washington wanted more than anything else. Um, the Senate was torn. They had to ratify the treaty. John Adams had to cast the tie-breaking vote, and he voted in support of the president. And so uh, it's called Jay's Treaty. Went into effect. Americans were furious, very unhappy. Um, George Washington felt probably for the first time a touch of being unpopular. Um, John Jay said that uh, as he traveled across the country when he returned, he could see his burning effigy all along uh, the border um, where people were bur born burning, like basically dolls of him or cutouts of him. Uh, but uh, Washington was able to keep the peace. Uh, finally, at the end of his eight years in office, George Washington determines he's gonna go back home and run the farm again. And um, he asked James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, and I think John Jay as well, to help him craft his um, goodbye speech. It's a very powerful speech. Um, and there were a couple of things in the speech, uh, his farewell address, that were pretty important. He warns against the two-party system and says, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But I think it was kind of inevitable. And then he also warns against alliances with foreign countries, that it, it could be very problematic for our young country to align ourselves up with any other country, that neutrality was the best course forward. All right, and then John Adams. He is the heir to the throne, so to speak. Um, of course, this was all new, but he had served faithfully as vice president. It made sense. 
that he would be nominated to run for president. So um, Thomas Jefferson, who had been sulking in his uh, sadness at his home in Monticello, had decided to come back into politics and run for president himself. The way the Constitution was originally written, however, um, let's see, the person who got the first, the highest number of electoral votes from the delegates would become president. The person that came up with the second most votes would become vice president. So you end up with two opposing parties, one president and one vice president. It would be like if in the last election, Joe Biden won and Donald Trump came in second. So he was the vice president. Can you imagine? Or to Donald Trump is president and Hillary Clinton is vice president. It would be horrible. That was eventually um, amended to, in the constitution. But John Adams finds himself barely beating Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is his vice president, isn't happy about being vice president, actually ends up going back to Monticello and not doing much uh, while he's vice president. So John Adams is tasked with the same situation that, John, uh, that George Washington had been. How do we keep our country out of a European conflict? Uh, um, and shortly after he took office, uh, French diplomats and government officials did something to that was very um um uh, considered disgraceful not not immoral but disgraceful uh that put them in a really bad light with americans uh and so americans opinion about the french flip on a dime during washington's administration they tended to be more pro-french and less british and the adams administration that flips around um, there was more support for England and less support for the French. So that's where we will pick up. I'm going to go over some of this information with you guys on Friday. I'm sure Mr. Heimler will discuss the Adams presidency as well in the videos that you'll watch. But we'll pick up with a brief overview of John Adams' presidency on Friday. Uh, and the, the test is going to be a multiple choice A push type of test. There won't be any uh, writing, SAQs, fill in the blanks or anything. It's just going to be straight on uh, multiple choice tests. So um, anyway, that's it. Whew, that was a lot more than I thought, but hopefully this will help you get up to speed.